Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Debbie Hart, the president and CEO of BioNJ. I'd like to welcome you to our Life Sciences CFO Roundtable, what Life Sciences CFOs need to know in 2023 in partnership with BioNJ member and sponsor of this session, BDO. According to BDO's 2023 Life Sciences CFO Outlook Survey, the link for which will be pasted into the chat box in just a moment if it's not already there, the industry is evolving from its pandemic gold rush years and companies are facing increasing pressure to manage cash and meet investor expectations. Just got a little more interesting in the last 10 days or so with the SVB and the banking situation um, will probably go down that path at some point during this conversation. Um, but anyway, there's lots to talk about. Over the next hour, our panel of financial leaders are going to discuss this new paradigm, as well as how to plan ahead for opportunities and possible risks. We'd ask you to please type your questions for our panelists in the Q&A box, and they will get to them at the end of the session. This program is being recorded and will be available tomorrow on bioNJ.org. So we are going to get started to, to lead our discussion today. I'd like to welcome and thank today's moderator, Principal and Life Sciences National Co-Leader for BDO, Lance Miner. So Lance, over to you, take it away. And thank you so much for doing this today. We appreciate it. Thank you, Debbie. I'm very excited for today's discussion. Good morning and welcome biotech leaders. Uh, very curious that, to uh, see where you are in the world, but uh, we know that you're facing many of the same opportunities and challenges of the industry. You know, historically, pharma has been uh, one of the most exciting and rapidly growing sectors of the economy. Uh, it has remained resilient despite the pandemic and recent capital hurdles. Uh, it's in part been riding the tailwinds of twin benefits of cheap capital and decades of work to achieve the recent technological breakthroughs. At this point, the industry is still attracting investments. Of course, it's now competing with the headwinds of inflation. While capital uh, firms are still investing in, uh, you know, across technologies, it is, um, you know, we're seeing challenges with cash flow uh, for the smaller startups, continued recruiting challenges, lingering supply chain and manufacturing capacity, uh, limiting the growth, uh, or at least slowing the de development process. With drug development often running into the billions of dollars, investments is essential to fuel the growth of these biotech startups or the longer held uh, pharmaceutical companies, which are often focused on developing high risk novel therapeutics based on the latest uh, scientific discoveries. As Debbie mentioned, the BDO uh, CFO Outlook Survey that actually pulls 600 CFOs across six industries to uncover and analyze key challenges facing the business and their plans for adapting and thriving in the current market environment. Our goal is to discover how CFOs are continuing to build resilience in the year ahead. The life science portion of the survey pulled CFOs from biotech, pharma, and med tech and med device, uh, as well as CDMOs and CMOs with revenues ranging from 100 million to 3 billion. The trends we're discussing today uh, cover the information provided in, in, the, in the survey. You know, overall, uh, the biotech industry the pharmaceutical industry presents tremendous opportunities for investors with the potential for significant returns. But of course, we need to understand how to best manage those risks. So today we have four leaders who will introduce themselves to hear how they're managing the key challenges of cash, talent, investor expectations, supply or manufacturing capacity, to name a few. Uh, with that, I'll uh, have the, the panelists introduce themselves, starting with Susan. Hi, uh, good, mor good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are today. Um, my name is Susan Blum. I'm the CFO of Melinda Therapeutics. We are a commercial stage acute care focused pharmaceutical company. We currently have six products on the market. We're a private company, so we don't publicly disclose uh, financial information, but I will share that we have been um, cash generating um, and self-sustaining for the last several years. In 2022, we were EBITDA positive. Um, so we are in growth mode. And um, I'm really looking forward to the discussion today. And thanks to the BioNG and video teams for the invitation to participate. Thank you. Moving over to Brian. Good day, everyone. Uh, Brian Lenz. I'm the EVP CFO of ADMA and the general manager of our subsidiary business unit, ADMA Biocenters. 
Adam is a publicly traded company with a market cap of about $700 million. We have three FDA approved products in the plasma derived um, immune globulin space. Uh, we're forecasting revenues this year to be about $200 million, $210 million or more, as well as profitability. I've been a public CFO for close to 20 years now in a variety of biotechs, pharmas, med device companies, raised over $500 million in my career, IPOs and uh, follow-ons, M&A, business development and uh, licensing are part of my uh, past experiences. Great to have you, Brian. Adapt. Thank you for having me. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Daphne Queamy. I'm the CFO of Amicus Therapeutics. We are a global commercial stage company. Uh, we currently have one product on the market in rare disease for uh, lysosomal storage disease for Fabry disease. We are hopefully uh, on the cusp of getting our second product approval. Um, we are uh, just about a $3 billion market cap, and we are turning the corner on profitability this year. That's our uh, external target. So great to be here and look forward to the discussion. Great news, Daphne. Thanks for joining. And Bob. Thanks, Lance. Bob Mecca, Senior Vice President of Finance at Beijing. Uh, Beijing is a 12-year-old biotech. We have three internally developed products that we sell, uh, as well as a number of Alliance products. Uh, the company is you know, growing quite rapidly. We have over 9,000 employees now. Uh, around the world as we've expanded our operations beyond uh, the US, China, and Europe, and Asia PAC. And we uh, excitedly crossed our, our 1 billion in sales during the, the fourth quarter of 2022 and continuing to focus on our growth. I've uh, been in the industry for about 25 years prior to Beijing. I spent uh, a long career, 22 years in a variety of senior executive roles at Brissom Myers Squibb. Thank you, Bob. And now jumping into some of the topics, which are all uh, here for. So in the manufacturing supply chain space, we all know very personally, as well as we've seen within the, in the industry, is that supply chain challenges uh, can affect us every day. Um, Bob, why don't we start with you? How have you seen uh, your investments shift to help manage some of those supply chain challenges? How do you manage uh, the, the challenge of excess capacity versus um, having too much, uh, not having enough capacity to meet market demand? Yeah, it's, it's a great question and, and certainly timely given the, you know, the, the elements of COVID and how they've impacted our industry. And we see in other industries impacted in different ways throughout time. And, and most of us have, have experienced that with COVID. Um, you know, supply chain resiliency is is you know just paramount. You know, Beijing is an oncology company, and so you know we are talking about life threatening uh, situations. And if we can't supply patients that are on our medicines, it, it obviously can be catastrophic. So we we are definitely focused on on significant investments in expanding our our capacity. Um, we are actually in the process of building a large-scale biologics and R&D site here in New Jersey, where, where I'm based. Um, but we've also spent a lot of time in, and um, you know, I've been on calls with suppliers when, like in the U.S., the, the government prioritized uh, companies that were making products that, that the world needed to, to recover from COVID. Um, so we have gone through you know, from starting materials through packaging, where we can build incremental inventory to, to buffer ourselves against global disruptions, both from the supply, but even transportation that, that we've all experienced. So, so we're really coming at it from, from every angle that we can to, to shore up and ensure, uh, you know, I'm pleased to say we have actually managed through uh, every, every possible disruption that we've come through but it has been uh, sometimes a brute force effort uh, and, and certainly a financial investment for the company, whether it's, it's building those inventories and, and tying up working capital or expanding our, our manufacturing presence and, uh, and, and taking on new suppliers to diversify our supply chain. So we've really gone at it from, from kind of every angle that, that we could. Oh, Daphne, I see you nodding your head as Bob speaks of the, the, the capital challenges uh, 
being in gene therapy, uh, I understand this could be particularly unique in finding capacity for uh, your products. How have you been managing the manufacturing capacity requirements? So from, a, from an amicus perspective, um, we work with contract manufacturers. So it's been a little bit, you know, things, um, the collaboration with our partners has been very key for us. And, um, you know, understanding that we, we don't have internal manufacturing, so it, not, it is not 100% within our control. So, you know, being able to really um, buckle down on our forecasts and trying to get those um, as accurate as possible. And then again, being able to share that information with our partners so that we can make the best of, you know, kind of these tight constraints of, of timelines and, and materials and, 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 and so forth. Um, it's just really been a collaborative effort for us um, as well as, you know, just again, trying to get as accurate as possible um, just so that you minimize the, any any sort of delays in in production and manufacturing because that then you know directly impacts your ability to get product to patients. So so that's been foremost in our minds. And Brian, I understand that uh, your organization has made significant investments in, in capacity as well. Tell us that story. Sure, absolutely. Um, so Adam has been in business since 2006. Um, up until 2017. We were your traditional virtual biotech where we'd outsource clinical studies, manufacturing, QA, QC, and regulatory. Then we were um, in the middle of 2016, we were hit with a CRL as a result of our positive phase three data study. Although our contract manufacturer here in Boca Raton, where I'm at today, was not manufacturing compliance with the FDA. So we decided, look, there's risks with biotech, whether it's capital, whether it's manufacturing, whether it's regulatory. And we decided to do is let's acquire our contract manufacturer. Certainly not for the faint of heart and not something that I would uh, recommend to do uh, un unless you're 100% sure this is uh, something that makes good business sense from a financial standpoint, from a uh, people standpoint to make sure you have the right people, call it in the right seats to, to drive the organization to success. Um, you know, the idea was is to vertically integrate all of the operations to really manage our own destiny, if you will. So since then, um, we've gotten all of our products FDA approved since 2017. And then we further decided, okay, let's, we need to focus on profitability. And how do we extract as much margin yield uh, out of the plant that we acquired in 2017? So in early 2020, we decided to embark on a supply chain, we call it supply chain self-sufficiency uh, goal, where we looked across the board of our testing laboratories. We looked at our raw material supply chain, where we collect our plasma to manufacture our three FDA approved products, as well as what opportunities do we have to double the capacity here in Boca to uh, extract more, again, yield more margin. If we can basically double double the manufacturing batches, which we did, and we had to get FDA approval from a 2,200 liter batch to a 4,400 liter batch, you're putting more, more raw material into the tanks, let's say. And from a direct labor standpoint, as everybody knows, it's one of the components of um, manufacturing products, direct labor, raw material and overhead, essentially didn't change the direct labor. It was just the raw material. So that component was the only variable and we were able to extract a significant amount more margin out of our products. So that was uh, something that we embarked on just as COVID was knocking on the door. And in the end, we were able to get FDA approvals and we turned the company around. And by making some of those changes, trying to be a bit more proactive, um, we were able to bring some more testing in house as well as we were able to bring more testing in the United States. So it sounds like a multi-pronged approach. Expand... In a short period of time, correct. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Expanding the capability, scaling up uh, the, the uh, bioreactor capacity, as well as expanding out. That's exactly right. Yep. Very impressive. And Susan, I, I know that you're also in the CMO space for your, your capacity. Uh, tell us a little bit about, uh, you know, while you're not directly expanding uh, facilities, tell us how you're managing that network. 
Yeah, so I, I relate to what Daphne was saying with, with respect to the CMOs. So we, we are responsible for not only supplying our domestic product that we sell directly to customers, but we are um, responsible for worldwide supply in many cases for our ex-US partners. So flexibility is the key and, and collaboration, just working very closely with the CMOs to uh, make sure we can pivot when necessary. And then thinking through the risks of supply, you know, we're very thoughtful about second source uh, and, and where do we need a second source? Um, so we've been, we've been thinking through those um, challenges and considerations um, as well as you know, managing other terms in CMO contracts like minimum order quantities. So to, to allow for the most flexibility as possible in moving forward, given you, know, you don't know what's coming around the corner. Exactly. I'm so glad to hear you talk about uh, contract flexibility. Um, this is something that is often overlooked. It can be very powerful in managing the uncertainty of forecasts, Daphne, that uh, no matter how you try to sharpen them are, are never right. There may be one day when you, you've got a perfect match between your supply and your demand, mm -hmm. but uh, managing the uncertainty that we always have um, it, it's certainly a challenge. Susan, I'm curious, since uh, Melenta is in the infectious disease space through COVID, did you see um, a, an additional spike in demand that further challenged your network? Yeah, so we, we actually have seen um, some spikes in demand uh, that were more indirectly related to COVID because we don't sell antiviral drugs, um, but, there were, but there was some additional um, increase in demand that we've been able to pivot. And, and frankly, it is about the collaboration with our CMOs and the ability to move quickly. And, and it also comes down to relationships. So where we can reach out and say, hey, you know, can we move this along a little faster? And, 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 the, and thankfully, uh, we've had some really great partners. Wonderful. It's an interesting counterpoint between uh, you, Brian, looking to uh, vertically integrate your network and ensure supply versus uh, managing relationships. Neither is, is very, very easy. Um, there were two other points that were touched on in that discussion of supply and manufacturing capital, uh, as well as partnerships, which we'll, we'll touch on um, after the next topic, which is talent, which is, of course, absolutely essential uh, whether you're working with a CMO and, and their capacity to be able to hire new people to, to meet the growing demand, or if you're building internally as Brian has and um, needing to hire talent and, and or train uh, talent. So, you know, with the current environment, we've known over the past handful of years, if not more, that recruiting has been very difficult with so much growth in the industry, with the uh, cheap capital and new technologies that have seen just a, a record number of, of IPOs and new startups, that it's been very difficult to do drug development as well as day-to-day uh, -day operations. So I'm, I'm curious, Bob, perhaps we can uh, go back to you to see how you've been managing this talent shortage and, and how it's been affecting him. Yeah, so so it's a, it's a great question and one that, uh, you know, we certainly see in the U.S. across all industries. Um, you know, Beijing has been growing uh, from a headcount perspective quite rapidly. Um, you know, we just got a, a major approval for, for a drug in the U.S. just earlier this year. So we've been building up all, all around the operations. Uh, one of the things that you know the, the company had before COVID, but really you know the the remote nature that that COVID forced many of us into, uh, we have maintained that. So we hired talent. And, you know, if if you're being hired to work in our new biologics facility, you need to physically be there, of course. But for areas like finance and and HR and sales and marketing, we we are actually very comfortable in a remote, remote environment. Um, I actually am in the office today, but that's not something I'm doing on a day-to-day -day basis. And so we hire where talent is. And we have found that, you know, in the current environment and climate and coming out of COVID, people are, are definitely attracted to that. You know, we, we do bring our teams together uh, and we're doing more of it like, like I am today, but, uh, 
that that has definitely helped to to allow us to not be constrained uh, to a, a specific area. Our, our main offices are in Cambridge, San Francisco, and, and New Jersey. So definitely, if we were limited to just those areas, which are very competitive, especially in, in our industry, I think we'd be facing more challenges than we are. But when we're able to, to attract talent, from the rest of the country and and you know leverage technology to connect people, that has definitely been something that that has helped. Um, you know, outside the U.S., it's a little bit different story, really really country dependent. Um, but again, leveraging a a flexible work arrangement has has certainly helped us with recruiting top talent around the the country and around the world. Uh, I'm, I'm curious, uh, Daphne, how you've been managing the, the hybrid versus in-office uh, challenge. Yeah, so um, we are we are currently in a in a hybrid environment. Um, we have a, a concept called All In Wednesdays, where we you know have asked all of our employees to come in on Wednesdays and basically left it up to the employees for to pick another day during the week. Um, to to come in based on business needs and and their teams, um, we we found that that's worked really well. And and I echo what Bob said about you know this this hybrid work um, situation has now let us uh, expand the search for talent. Um, so that's actually worked out really well for us. Um, we do have um, you know we do have office space available. We do have a lab facility. So obviously you know the the scientists will need to go into the lab. Um, but but I think the flexibility is what's appreciated by the workforce. Um, I would say, you know, in uh, just a recent topic, especially in our industry, you know, there have been a number of companies um, that have experienced um, reductions in force. So I do think that the 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 recruiting of talent um, is is, you know, there, there are people out there looking for for new situations and new opportunities. So I do think that is an opportunity for, for companies that are hiring. Um, and the other point I'll make is, you know, I, you know, I think there, there's a lot to be said about basic compensation and, and, and compensation plans, but I do think um, employees are looking for other benefits as well. You know, a, a robust um, benefit plan, healthcare is, is something that's, you know, obviously we, we all deal with it on a daily basis, but even in our personal lives, healthcare can be very expensive. So I think that's something that we at Amicus look at as well is, is trying to uh, maintain a robust healthcare plan for employees and, and other, you know, maybe non-financial um, benefits as well, you know, kind of uh, we have the concept of, of a family day where we shut down the, com the company globally. Um, that seems to be re really appreciated by by employees as well. So so we're we're looking at all all of those types of items to you know uh, attract and retain uh, the workforce that we have. Multimodality, the diversity we discussed earlier. I'm uh, so Brian. I know that you have had challenges, and as well as Susan. But starting with Brian, I know you've had challenges with the the Great Resignation. How have you managed it? Yeah, we certainly have. Certainly not not immune to the uh, great resignation. Um, just going back to 2017 to give everybody kind of a, a feel for how the company has exponentially grown. And in 2017, prior to acquiring our contract manufacturer, we had about 20 employees. Uh, today, we're sitting with about 630 employees slated to grow to another uh, 200 plus employees. So I mean, by the end of um, 2023, we should be close to 800 employees. That being said, we've we saw, I'll call it more significant turnover over the last you know, year and a half to two years, where in some parts of the business, our subsidiary business unit was you know, maybe a 20 or 30% uh, historical turnover rate, which during COVID, uh, hourly workers in certain parts of the country, um, our workers, our, our um, turnover rate was approaching 30, 40%. Uh, that has certainly calmed down a bit. Um, now that um, you know, called the country is back to reopening in you know, all states. Uh, one of the things we did implement was a employee retention program for several, several key staff members, which um, some staff members, it was for a year, some was a year and a half, depending on the role, depending on the responsibility, which 
seemed to work very well. We were able to retain uh, several employees. Uh, and that was, um, I guess, just over the last year and a half. Uh, we do have a um, work from home flexibility uh, policy, depending on, just as Bob said, just de depending on the position, depending on the role, depending on um, the individual, do we need finance, accounting, IT, certain roles that, you know, really just touch paper during the day versus touching products and manufacturing. Obviously, folks that manufacture our products need to be here every day. And folks that are collecting our plasma need to be on the floor at our uh, plasma collection centers. But uh, if there's opportunities, we do try to even be flexible to, uh, to those folks as well. And we try to have a, um, a fun atmosphere as much as that's uh, possible in this, in this environment that we're in with um, bank failures and uh, inflation and other, other uh, you know, the great resignation pandemic. and so forth, <laughs> pandemic. Um, you know, we'll do, um, we have a um, food trucks that come on site. We'll do um, annual uh, get togethers, annual holiday parties. Um, we'll do like an ice cream day. We'll do, I mean, in here in Florida, you got to watch in August for an ice cream day, but you know, typically there's, there's things we do out throughout the year, which is, which is very nice that we try to bring employees, uh, together, even if it's just for, you know, a lunchtime for employee appreciation day. Um, when we hit certain goals, we, one of the things we certainly, and one of the things we've definitely done is I I've told, uh, our, our CEO and, and other folks, make sure you celebrate your successes. Um, because they happen quick and um, it's something that um, you want to obviously, you know, remember to relive those successes because there's, there's times that you're going to experience like we have many times um, where there's peaks and valleys and you got to go back to those successes and, and rely on those, uh, those memories to keep, you know, to keep moving forward. Indeed. And Susan, how, have, how, how has the great resignation touched your organization? Yeah, so we were we were um, experienced some some of that, you know, during the early period of COVID, and and it's really rebounded uh, since in the last year to two years, and similar to to Daphne's comment about the full benefit picture, you know, I think that that's really important. Employees are really looking to um, look for fair compensation, but and above and beyond that, we're really focused on the culture of the organization. So we, we regularly send out employee surveys and we really take them to heart. And, and what can we do to improve the culture within Melinta? And some of the things that we've done is we've you know, developed long-term development plans for every single employee that we have. So everybody's got a development plan. We wanna make sure everybody has an opportunity to learn, grow and develop in the organization. And um, you know, we, we do have a hybrid environment as well, um, but we try to create opportunities for the teams to come together in the office, even if you're a remote based individual. So every quarter or however often we, we wanna bring people together. We just uh, opened a new office in, in Parsippany. It's a collaborative space. Basically anyone who wants to come in can, is, is welcome. Uh, so so it's, it's, it's about for us, um, really driving a culture um, that, that makes people wanna to come to the office and be collaborative um, and, and feel valued. And, and, and what Brian said, celebrating the wins, we are really focused on celebrating our wins as well. Like we need to take time to celebrate the wins because it's really important and it's a huge morale boost across the organization as well. So That's really a reminder. Those are, those are some of the things that, that we're doing. <laughs> I have two questions from, from the audience that uh, when we can reflect on them uh, in any way that you see fit, uh, either with the, uh, the first discussion around the, the capital required to expand capacity to or order and ensure second sources, uh, or uh, with the discussion we just had around uh, talent management. Uh, the first question is how have you considered uh, ESG, and you're thinking about uh, whether you go hybrid or in office, or how have you considered ESG with regard to managing uh, your your capital investments and your facility expansion? Uh, who would like to go first? Give you a second to think about that. Daphne? 
from? Yeah, so I think from a from an ESG perspective, you know, on, on the E part, because we don't have our own manufacturing location, what we do is, you know, we 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 ensure that our partners and our CMOs have robust um, you know, environmental controls um, so that we can, you know, kind of rely on that and as we do our own ESG reporting. I think from a from a social perspective, um, we we have our our commitment to patients, and you know from a as Susan mentioned from a from a culture perspective, we make sure that that's really embedded in our culture, and that that comes across in our. We also do employee surveys um, just to see how the how the employees are feeling, um, and what we can improve on, what we do well, and what we can improve on, and that always comes across really loud and clear for us. So. So I think from a from a social, um, we do have a number of DEI initiatives as well that we run as a company. Um, so so that is is front and center for us. And then from a governance perspective, um, I think um, we have a very strong um, board set up and and a set of of governance rules there. Um, you know, we obviously we comply with all of the public company. Uh, aspects of it, but I think uh, for, we we actually do go a, a bit above and beyond on that um, from 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 a governance perspective. Um, so so I do I all of that is included in in how we run basically run our business and allocate our capital. Um, you know the ESG initiatives are are an important aspect. We we hear about that directly from our investors. Some of our investors um, even before they actually ask about what's going on in the business. Um, they they want to go through their ESG questions and their specific checklists. So so we so that is something that is front and center for us at Amicus. Very good. And Brian, I think you may have had a comment. Sure. You know what's what's interesting is before um, ESG really started taking a taking a hold from a from a disclosure standpoint, um, we looked back and we said, all right, we want to start providing more uh, transparency, more disclosure, and as it relates to ESG, and we looked at our employee handbook, we looked at our code of ethics, and we looked at some of our SOPs, our protocols, our um, policies and procedures, and we found out we're doing a lot of things already from an ESG standpoint, from, from an environmental standpoint, you know, how are we handling our environmental waste? What does it say? And because we, as I as I mentioned, we manufacture all of our own products. So, you know, how do we handle environmental waste? What are, what are we doing specifically to protect the environment? So we looked at some of our policies and procedures, again, that were obviously already in place before ESG. And so we were able to take that information and um, incorporate that into our 10K, into our other public disclosures website, as well as um, our code of ethics. Diversity, same thing. I mean, we look at our hiring practices. We look across the board at our... Um, subsidiary business unit, as well as our biomanufacturing unit. And we ensure that, you know, there's diversity. We even, we've set it on our website years before uh, ESG even came to the forefront. We've always talked about diversity, uh, especially on our website. And then governance, our, you know, we look, as I said, we're a public company. We look at our um, board structure, we look at our code of ethics, and we ensure that, um, you know, certainly in compliance and want to be, you um, obviously transparent and provide appropriate disclosure and you know, ensure that um, not only just are we meeting the requirements, but it's interesting once you find out that you're already doing things, um, it's, you know, why not, why not disclose it and, and show that um, you're, you're certainly um, mindful of um, ESG and mindful of the environment and um, other components. And when you were building your new facilities, did, mm -hmm. how did that come to play? So when the so the facility was already built, and the way we oh. looked at it is is um, the facility's been here since the early '90s. We acquired it, as I mentioned, in, in the middle of 2017. But being an FDA compliant CGMP, FDA regulated manufacturing facility, environmental controls, environmental waste, environmental hazard, all these types of things, you have to have SOPs, a quality a quality management system in place. Yeah. So looking at that quality management system and your SOPs, a lot of that information, how do you handle environmental waste? How do you, how do you handle manufacturing processes and disposal of environmental waste and your, and your impact to the environment? So it's interesting. A lot of that was, uh, I don't want to say baked in, but you know, obviously we, we 
enhance that process because the process previously, it was a broken process. We inherited it, it called a defunct plant. Sure. And then we turned the plant around by improving on those processes and being more transparent with uh, not just the FDA, but I, I also think other public disclosures that we've been making. Yeah, so it's really the cost of doing business. It's uh, the cost but, of doing business. What was interesting, as I said, I found out we're, we're already doing, we were already doing some of it, which was, which was nice to see. It wasn't, we had to rehaul or re revamp um, right. just to you know, meet ESG requirements, if you will. We were maybe at, one, maybe at one point we were a little ahead of the game. Right. It wasn't a big cultural shift, which is no. great. No. Um, and speaking of, of cash, and we'll, we'll get to uh, the discussion of IPOs and, and what's happening with that, that market since there's been a big change uh, since last year. Uh, but there, we have a question from the audience and asking how, uh, with regard to... Uh, ensuring cybersecurity and data privacy. Uh, is this another cost of doing business? And how are you managing the, the balance of ensuring good data privacy and cybersecurity with trying to maximize the funds necessary for running um, your, your manufacturing operations or, or funneling money into R&D? Susan? Yeah, sure. So, um, so for Melinta, um, this is this is a very high priority for us, focusing on cybersecurity and data privacy. And so, what we've done is we've we've engaged consultants to to help support um, like a risk assessment for us, and then help us build a roadmap to you know like where we are today to where we want to be you know even one two years from now. So we're prioritizing um, how we implement a very broad program. Um, and, and we have a strategic plan where we just have, have layered in the cost that it's going to take to do it. And we've been in, informing our board as we go. So we, they know that we were performing this analysis and we're, and we brought in an advisor actually, um, to talk to our executive committee. So everybody is kind of on board with, with the why and why it's so important. And then it's a matter of just prioritization of the cash and building that roadmap to prioritize the highest priorities um, and then maybe the lower hanging fruit and then uh, kind of stagger or phase the implementation of a broader program over, over a period of time. And Bob, I see you nodding your head. Yeah, so I mean, cybersecurity is just a, a huge risk for, for us, right? And especially as, <clears throat> as we all went virtual and, and relied on you know, expanded networks. Uh, at Beijing, you know, under the, the leadership of our CIO, certainly we have built a, a strong program. It's high on the radar screen with our board. We, we report out to our audit committee every quarter, uh, and, and they've really taken a multi-pronged approach, of course, leveraging technology and, and securing our, our infrastructure. But, you know, as we all know, there's, there's so many ways to get in, and, and employees happen to be one of those ways. So, I always enjoy the uh, the fake emails that you get and the attempts to get people to click on and the reporting and you know you get the nice little notification good job you didn't fall for it this time um, but it it is training it is policies it's procedures um, you know it really is a 360 degree you know game of of defense. Um, and, and you have to make those investments. The, the costs of failure are just phenomenal, especially in an industry like ours, where intellectual property is you know, just so paramount to what we do. The, the large investments companies make in research and, and creating that IP, uh, but also just keeping your operations going. So yeah, we, we absolutely make those investments both from a you know, investing in, in technology, um, but also investing in the people that we have both directly involved, as well as the programs to just keep everyone vigilant. I, 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 uh, I love the, uh, the phishing tests. Uh, at BDO, we take cybersecurity very seriously since we hold many of the, the, the crown jewels for uh, many life science firms. And uh, it's actually helped me educate my, my parents to ensure that they don't fall for the phishing test. Um, I have so one that you could uh, 
you one more leave a thumb drive or a uh, memory stick in the parking sure. lot and see what somebody does we've uh <laughs> you go through you can go through that as well uh do they plug it in the machine or do they uh bring it to it and say hey i found this but um but cybersecurity, it's either I, we look at it as you either going to pay me now or pay me later right. and it's um liability uh cybersecurity insurance is certainly key i think to um to most businesses but we embark on the same strategy as, as susan and bob where we do we uh we employed a third party third party contractor to do penetration testing whether it's in software or hardware scenarios and it's interesting what what can come up and you could see where there's vulnerabilities because there's you know what we're doing here today and what we're going to do after this call that's that's our day job and the hackers and the people looking to penetrate and infiltrate your system that's okay. their job that's their and, it, and it, cha it changes all the time yeah. yeah and just just to add one more comment with the with the current svb environment um there's a lot of people changing banks a lot of hmm. uh new accounts opened up great point. lots of emails with hey our wiring instructions changed it is yep. prime uh, opportunity for those yep. fraudsters to get yep. in so I, again, it, the user awareness is super important. We've sent several emails to our employees saying, you know, we know we wanted you to be on the lookout before, now be on the lookout like even more. And any email you receive, be skeptical. Um, and, and so it, it's just a, a very challenging environment right now. Excellent public service announcement, Susan. Thank you. <laughs> yes. yeah. uh, and Daphne, we touched on cybersecurity, but uh, being in gene therapy, I would guess data privacy is particularly uh, challenging. How do you manage that? Yeah, I would say, you know, similar to the comments we just heard, like the, the price of not uh, investing in policies, procedures, people as it relates to data privacy, I think is, is, is sim very similar to not investing in cybersecurity. I mean, in Europe, um, especially the, the fines for G not being GDPR. compliant with, yeah. with, yeah, with GDPR are, are just, um, you know, they're, they're pretty hefty. So, so I, you know, as Brian said, you know, pay me now or pay me later. So I think we approach it the same way is say, look, you know, we, we, the one thing we do, we try to make it a little bit fit for purpose. You know, we are a smaller sure. company, so, you know, we don't need all of the policies and procedures and, and, and all of the trainings, maybe that, uh, 10,000 person company needs. So, so we definitely try to at least try to manage the costs of implementing and maintaining those policies and procedures on a, in a fit for purpose basis. And, you know, obviously as we continue to grow, we will need to evaluate and continue to, to enhance and improve those um, policies and processes. But uh, so we do look at the cost and try to make sure that it's, it's, it's right for our size um, and, and the same as, you know, with the with the cybersecurity, um, that one is is a little bit more involved as it relates to training of personnel. Um, again, you, you've mentioned the, the phishing and the testing that needs to get done. But um, but but that's how we that's how we address it. Great. Thanks, Stephanie. You know, moving on to IPOs and, and the cash management uh, again, the the market has been chaotic, turning down valuations are dropping. Capital's harder to get hold of. Uh, Brian, tell us a little bit about uh, how you've been been managing uh, the, the changes in the market right now since you. Sure. So, I mean, on a uh, on a daily basis, you know, I'm sure everybody's reading Wall Street Journal or maybe they receive CFO alerts uh, every day. You're seeing some type of drastic measure being taken, whether it's cutting workforce, proactive realignment. Reducing salaries as of right now, uh, there's 219 negative enterprise value life science companies that are out there, meaning that uh, I'm sure everybody knows what that means. But if, if you don't, companies have more cash on their balance sheet, uh, 219 companies have more cash on their balance sheet than their, their market cap, um, you know, whether it's blow ups or there's other been other issues. But that has certainly spurred activism, which we've um, had the pleasure of uh, enjoying for you know some some time um and i I'll, I'll say we landed on the right side of the line which was which is nice but m a volume starting to pick up a little bit slow um but i think that has to do with some of these depressed valuations maybe it'll pick up 
And then just waking up to um, changes in drug pricing, Inflation Reduction Act, um, you know, leaves obviously a lot of sleepless nights for 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 you know folks like us on the call. What have what have we done? And my best advice, thinking about um, companies our size and and even smaller, is challenge expenses, challenge your opex, challenge your R and D, challenge your SGNA. If you're wondering about a program that's maybe years out. If you're wondering about a program that may or may not uh, come to fruition, if you're looking at headcount, uh, there's another thing that you'll, you'll read quite often, especially in technology companies more often, is um, there's a lot of workforce reductions that are taking place. And you know, perhaps it was in the 2020, 2021, where the great resignation companies were looking to staff up because of the fear of, their tur of their, the turnover, uh, and maybe some companies overhired. But I think one of the things that we did this past budget season is we went for a very we went through a very strenuous process of looking at you know, department level um, needs and can you do more with less as the saying as the saying goes and you know, we're we're on a um, trajectory of cash flow break even profitability towards the end of this year early 2024 and really the only way to do that is you, know, you have to be disciplined and really take a hard look at your operating expenditures. Um, so that's, and then obviously if you can try to really target for more than a year, hopefully two years worth of cash, but we you know, we went through a proactive realignment process and just challenging the expenses and making sure that is this program the right program or should we put that on the back burner and focus on one program or two programs or what is your strategy for the year? If it is to be profitable, well, there's the one thing that you, need to certainly do is take a disciplined, again, disciplined, hard look at, um, at expenses. And, and Bob, how, how have you seen the, uh, the capital markets affecting your organization? Yeah, so, so at Beijing, we're, we're actually fortunate in, in having a very strong cash position. We had actually had a, a uh, equity offering um, and, and listed on the China Stars Exchange back at the end of 2021. So from that perspective, we're we're in a, a good place, but that doesn't mean we we don't do all the things that Brian talked about. And and uh, you know, as as the market changed heading December into January of last year, January 2022, we actually kicked off a financial excellence initiative. Um, and being a young company and and being a company that that was used to and, and focused on growth and why we continue to do that, we're really motivating people to, to have that financial discipline that um, you know, is, is probably more, more a, a hallmark of larger mature companies that have been through the cycles before. And, and why we continue to invest and we continue to grow, we're, we're telling people, let's figure out how we can optimize and, and be disciplined and be more efficient and create the, the next round of, if you will, capital to reinvest in the business. And, and that is an initiative where we're continuing to drive. We report on it to, to our board. Um, it is building a, a, I'll call it a new muscle. Many, many of our, our, our teams have come from you know, other biotechs or, or other mature companies. So people have that, that experience but it's bringing it together in, in a concerted fashion and, and just really trying to, to train the organization and, and make it part of our DNA to how do we just continue to every, every day, every week, every month, become more efficient um, while we grow and, and what can we, can, can we finance ourselves just through efficiency? So that's, that's a big thing that, that we're focused on. Um, while while experiencing you know strong strong top line growth through through all of 22 and as we look forward, that can be a very challenging situation to be announcing strong top line growth but simultaneously looking at cost savings and efficiency. It, but it, a, it is a a uh, I tell my finance team we have to be ambidextrous. That's right. right. It can't right. just be one thing. That's right. And Susan, you've had a very interesting story on uh, the capital markets. Yeah, so we're we're a private company, um, but we we always want to be in a position where you know if if the opportunity presented itself, we'd be ready to go. But um, anyway, it's 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 nice being private, I must say, or out of the public spotlight. 
um, less pressure on a quarterly basis in terms of like meeting guidance um, and hitting targets, but we are still very focused on driving profitability um, and driving cash flow. And, and, and obviously, I, and from what the, the team has said, I completely agree. It's, it's largely about controlling your operating expenses. And, and what Melinda calls, um, we have a, a priority is operational excellence. So operational excellence, you know, comprises not only, you know, how can we drive down OpEx, but how can we streamline? How can we automate? And, and how are we going to invest in systems that are leverageable um, today to drive efficiencies in the future? And so we're very focused on those strategic investments that, that we're making um, in those areas. And um, we also have, um, you know, in, in, in order to try to reduce OpEx as much as possible, you know, we're, we're implementing processes where we have to get multiple bids for certain services that, that are greater than a certain amount. So it's, it's like non-negotiable, right? It, it, we want to make sure that we create a competitive process and more times out of not, you can, you create a competitive process and you can drive down costs. If a vendor thinks that there's a, a, another vendor in the mix, um, they, they typically sharpen their pencils. So that's one, one way that we found that we can drive down costs. So we have a, another question from the audience uh, about cash management, but from a different, from a tax angle uh, for, for anybody uh, on the panel. Um, how have your respective companies been impacted by the capitalization of R&D expenses from Section 174? Um, and are you working to get this repealed? Are uh, part of any of, of your groups advocating for change or any other thoughts on, on this topic? Daphne, it looks like you've uh, been thinking about this. Sure. So, I mean, just to, to, to address that point, but also on, on what the, the recent comments were, I mean, I think when, when you're looking at um, controlling spend, um, I think for us, it's really looking at our future program, our future development programs. So this touches on, you know, the, the, the spend um, and R&D capitalization as it relates to Section 174. We, we are taking a close look at our spend. Um, and you know, prioritizing and focusing, maybe not on you know a whole slate of programs, but maybe just picking one or two um, and looking at those in the short term. Again, trying to control our opex, look at our profit, make sure we hit our profitability metric, um, but also you know taking a close look at what will section 174 does impact us. What does it mean for our tax planning moving forward? Um, we have not turned a profit yet, so we do have a significant number of NOLs um, that are that are valuable to us. However, you know, now with this change, we may need to start looking at those NOLs and start using them sooner than maybe I had forecast for, you know, in our longer term valuation model. So so all of that, I think, you know, plays into this. And it's really, um, I think, you know, quite sadly, will impact innovation um, as it relates to our industry. Um, and people will pause and think twice before trying to invest in certain programs. Um, now, as it relates to you know working on getting the getting this you know overturned, repealed, um, I do I am aware of there are some groups out there doing that. Um, you know, obviously as an industry, I think we we should participate in that. Um, I I for this is my personal opinion only. I I don't have a lot of hope of of that being overturned, but but you know definitely will support any any and all efforts to to try to get that changed. Uh, any other comments from the panel on this? We have uh, one more topic I wanted to address, and that is collaboration. Uh, we've been anticipating that the challenge in the capital markets, the drop in IPOs, you know, we have seen. Um, only 13% in our CFO survey, only 13% of life science companies are say they're planning to go IPO this, this uh, calendar year, which is, I think, a, a, it seems a little surprising given where we are, but in, in a way it's much less than uh, we've had. Uh, but one of the ways to manage cash is through collaborations. Uh, we've talked about the collaborations with CMOs and, and how that, those partnerships can be essential. Um, we talked about how to manage uh, uh, cash through cybersecurity, 
uh, retention programs to be able to manage talent. Uh, but you know, of course, you have to feed the beast. The art, the, the development portfolio needs to to keep growing, um, and co-development, co-marketing agreements are often uh, the way to do that. Um, without disclosing any uh, private information, how do you see this playing out? Is it something that's enticing, or is it uh, more headache than is necessary, given given where you are? Yeah, so I'll start. Um, for us, um, it is a key element of our strategy. I mean, we, we look to bring more products uh, onto the market. And if we can leverage other companies' development efforts and, and we can then leverage our commercial infrastructure to bring those products to market, we, we absolutely want to do that. So kind of sh sharing the cost benefit with, um, with the party who's developing the product. Excellent. And Daphne, I believe that your uh, co-development activities are, are robust as well. So, uh, I mean, we we are always looking at opportunities. I would say, um, you know, to, uh, the comment was made earlier about a number of companies in our industry with um, uh, distressed financial positions. Um, I do think, you know, for those companies with stronger balance sheets, it, this is an, an opportunity. To partner with some of those companies to keep moving those programs forward, um, you know that'll provide some additional capital for those companies that can't access the the normal capital markets uh, channels. So I do think this is you know in, in a downturn in our industry there is a little bit of an upside here if we can find you know the right partners to get together they can actually uh, help each other out. One helping the, the balance sheet, the other one uh, you know just partnering together to move programs forward. Um, and, and continue the innovation. Well, that is a, a great place to, to wrap up our conversation for today. Uh, I'm, I'm very uh, impressed by the way that you guys have been managing the challenges in the marketplace, looking for silver linings, and uh, look forward to seeing how the, the year progresses for, for each of you. And with that, I'll hand it back to Debbie for her closing comments. Thank you so much, Lance, and also Daphne, Susan, Bob, and Brian. We very much appreciate your comments. Um, happy to hear that your companies are, sounds like you're doing pretty well out there, and we're very happy for you and certainly proud of you. Um, so uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, once again, a recording of the program will be available on BioNJ's website tomorrow. And, you know, given that we are the Trade Association for Life Sciences in New Jersey, we're, we're here to serve you and including advocating on the industry's behalf on, you know, you mentioned the Section 174 tax issue. In fact, there was a uh, there's a piece of legislation in New Jersey um, that was just posted today in the legislature that we hope will address the New Jersey portion of that. Um, we're also advocating um, on behalf of changes to the Inflation Reduction Act, drug pricing policy, IP wa waivers. In fact, I'm going to testify later this month in Washington um, on uh, on the you know the trips waivers and related other things that were you know were we fear might happen as a result of opening that floodgate. Um, also, PBM is telling the story of the value of med medical innovation and more. So if you aren't a BioNJ member yet, I'd encourage you to please consider joining Sherry Hennessy on our team or any of our team members would be very happy to talk to you about that. Also, if anyone's interested in doing a webinar like this, um, please let us know. We'd love to uh, work with you on that. BDO was a tremendous partner um, on this, and they brought us the topic and really, um, you know, gave us a list of folks we'd, they would like to hear from. And, you know, we've, uh, we have these four excellent CFOs on, on the line. So thank you for that partnership. Hope to see you all at future BioNJ events, including our biopartnering conference in concert with JP Morgan, j, j Innovation, and Morgan Lewis on April 18th. BioNJ.org for a full calendar of events. Thank you for hearing me out. <laughs> thank you all for joining so much and hope you have a great afternoon.